Uh, I'd like to invite uh, uh, John Hato. John is a, a, a patient of mine and a business leader and, and a leader of his local Rotary Club as well. And uh, he's been a, a strong advocate. I mean, he's helped us in many ways, and including his involvement in, in some patient focus groups in which he's worked with the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer and, and helped provide some information that helps us help you and so um, uh, he had offered to, to to talk today and we were grateful to have him uh, so maybe without further ado I'll ask John to come up and, and present his experience you have cancer three little words translated into enormous meaning for my life those were the words that my family physician said to me as he walked into the examination room of his clinic on April 25th, 2013. The results of the pathology report following my colonoscopy of the previous week had come in. My mind raced. Why? How? And why me? But I'm skipping ahead. My name is John Hato. I'm 63 years old. I was born and raised in Montreal. And I'm an engineer who screwed things up by getting an MBA and then worked in the telecom manufacturing sector for most of my life. My work had me in a plane nearly every week. Business lunches, dinners were all part of my job description. I was always very active in sports. And I ski raced. I played competitive tennis. I raced triathlons, completed two marathons. The wear and tear of these sports put on my joints was quite evident as arthritis, arthritis grew in my ankles, my knees, and my hips. So, so much so that by the end of 2012, I, uh, I had a total hip replacement. It slows you down. <laughs> so much so that the hips uh, were affecting me but what has all this got to do with cancer? Well, I really didn't think about much before, before I was diagnosed, but now I see some dots being connected. During the summer of 2012, I hobbling on crutches, <laughs> and I was gaining weight and leading a very relatively sedentary life. The job I had changed, and so I was traveling less staying at home with, at the home office more consistently. I started to notice some strange things occurring during my bowel movements. No longer were there these huge logs, uh, evidence from my sons when he ever, uh, they didn't flush the toilet. <laughs> Instead, my stool was broken up and not consistent. And there were red spots and sometimes liquid. I thought originally that it was something I ate, I'm Polish, so I love beets, or drank, but when the blood was more frequent, I knew something was wrong. So I scheduled an appointment with my family physician who found hemorrhoids. And so he prescribed hemorrhoidal suppositories as the solution. Well, obviously, it didn't solve the problem. One day, there was an extraordinary amount of blood, and so I went back to see him and said, there is something wrong. That was about mid-October 2012. Well, being practical, I thought there was a simple answer to what was happening, and if I changed my eating habits, all would be solved. My family doctor sent the urgent request for colonoscopy to the Royal Columbian Hospital, I received an appointment for April 30th, 2013, close to six months later. The blood in my stool was there sometimes and sometimes was not. I didn't worry, really thinking there was no urgency. On the day of my colonoscopy, I have two stories. <coughs> One that I can remember, and then one that my wife recalls. Although I can usually depend on my memory, 
of things, and there was a question of anesthetic that had been administered. I remember an image of an ugly looking bloody mass the physician showed me on the screen. At first, he said, several polyps were also found and removed. But the physician from the Royal Columbian Hospital couldn't remove this larger mass through his scope. He suggested it might be removed by another method. And until the biopsy came back, it was not going to tell me that it was definitely cancer. My wife remembers it was cancer. Well, no panic on my side, I thought. Like an engineer should, we won't know until the biopsy comes back. Which puts me into my doctor's chair, listening to the words, you have cancer. Welcome to a new reality. Welcome to the ever-growing club. Welcome to wearing the letter C on your jacket for the rest of your uncertain life. The first thing I said was, get this fucking thing out of me. And I remember saying that. <laughs> I wanted an operation the next day. My anxiety was somewhat relieved by when the doctor told me that it was deemed a slow growing cancer, as the one you heard from Mr. Jobs, and had probably been there for quite some time. Well, it helped, but I still wanted it out of me. When I got home, the tears started. Uh, I talked to my wife, Cindy, who works in the healthcare system, about what to do. My head swam with the thought of dying. I started to question whether I would meet my grandchildren. Then I wondered if I would be at any of my three sons' marriages. Finally, I wondered, and this struck me very hard, whether I would see my youngest son receive his iron ring graduating from McGill in mechanical engineering, another one of those engineers. It was even more difficult when he came home that following that last exam, his last exam, and I sat in the garden and managed to tell him I had cancer. That was hard. I told the other two boys who lived and are still living in New York City on the phone. It was still very difficult, and I couldn't answer many of their questions. I was at a funeral today. It was for a very close friend of mine. And he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer two weeks ago, or actually four weeks ago. He died two weeks ago. His daughter was saying how much she will miss not having him at her wedding in May. It's a sad thing. It's a terrible thing. So I had already picked out my funeral songs. <laughs> Better to burn out than to fade away, Neil Young. And I'm here for a good time, not a long time. I love those. They fit me to the T. I played those songs. I imagined people remembering me. And I thought about drinking all the good wines in my, ce my cellar. I thought, oh my gosh, all those wines and single malts, I'll never get to try. <laughs> well, yeah, those things go, go through your mind. I recall one constant theme, though. I told my boys, they must have a colonoscopy by the time they are 40. No questions. I also said to eliminate red meats, prepared meats, and their diets, as well as to limit their consumption of alcohol. Basically, I wanted them to lead a healthy lifestyle. A friend and an enemy at the same time was, and still is, the internet. The first thing you come across online is, what stage are you at? Well, stage one sounds pretty simple, and I know we've reviewed the stages. Polyps easily removed, the lining of the wall unaffected, survivor outcome, pretty good. That wasn't me. 
Stage two, a tumor embedded in the wall beginning to ingress into the wall. Still wasn't me, maybe. Outcomes are still in your favor. And stage three, which is where the doctor performing the colonoscopy thought I was at, was, it was, is nastier. Now the cancer has spread to the lymph nodes in the area, opening the door to widespread destruction. Here, the survival rate drops, and you're on a balance beam. And finally, stage four, the number no one wants to hear. Odds are definitely against you, but there are always those few who make it. I mean, someone has to win the lottery. So now I'm <clears throat> in the period of what is going to happen to me. Well, at 61, I thought I'm not ready to die. My father passed away at 93, and although my mother had breast cancer, which took her at 72, I thought I had good genes in me. I am not ready to go. I was going to diet and stop alcohol, and more importantly, get moving again. Those were my self-prescriptions. But I was not satisfied with my health plan until I found a surgeon I could trust and feel confident with. So I started researching my favorite nemesis, the internet, and came across the registry of physicians in BC, which, by the way, has patient reviews of their treatment. The colorectal group from St. Paul's popped up on my screen. And after asking a couple of people and receiving great reviews, chose Dr. Carl Brown to be my surgeon. I was actually offered another surgeon from Royal Columbian and decided to take my surgery into my own hands. And that's why I did that research. I was still very adamant about having the surgery as soon as possible. I met Dr. Brown at St. Paul's for the first time on May 27th. My immediate impression was that of a caring professional. The facts were laid out, the parameters of what we knew were laid out, up options were put on the table. Forecasted results were discussed along with those 1% they always talk about. Oh, 1% of anesthetic problems, the infections, function problems, and the worst problem of all, leaving me with no problems. Only my wife with all of them. <coughs> As I said, I'm an engineer. <coughs> the subsequent meetings always substantiated the first. I picked out a great surgeon who cared. This confidence helped me and was fortified when I found out, well, that's my son when I told him in the, yeah, that's him there. When I found out that my good friend Janice O'Mara, who is here tonight, had the same surgeon. She also reflected my sentiments. The ball was rolling. For the type of cancer I had, the protocol was radiation and chemo first, then surgery, then more chemo. I had rectal surgery, rectal cancer. So that was the protocol, as you saw earlier, and that's what I went through. All this meant that I was going to live a little longer with this nasty, unwelcome guest. I was assured that the alternative of doing nothing did not have a good outcome. So I entered the system, which uh, the, the system is, of course, the BC Cancer Agency, or BCCA, not to be confused with the BCAA, <laughs> which begs the question, why do we do such a good job in preventative maintenance for our cars, yet when it comes to our own bodies, we let that slip away? The BCCA, following my experience with it, is one of the best. It's one of the world's best. We've, we've, if we're going to have cancer, it's best to have it in this province. Following visits with Dr. Roy Ma, our, our radiologist oncologist, and Dr. Hagen Kenecki, our the, uh, oncologist, I was to start radiation and chemo by pill form on July 4th, 2013. Independence Day for the USA, and hopefully for me, as I battled this thing. I decided that, considering the summer weather, 
I would cycle the 16 kilometers to the cancer agency. Feeling okay, I cycled home too. Then I decided that I was going to take on the challenge and cycle every day until my treatment was completed on August the 12th. Occasionally, I would even ride to Kitt's pool and do some laps. The day before my surgery, I went for a ride with my wife, Cindy. This is me getting ready in all the time that I was preparing for the surgery. And this is myself in August of that same summer. And that's me on the day before my surgery. Um, I had lost a lot of weight, which I attributed to cycling. At least I constantly attribute it to cycling. It could have been a little bit of the radiation and the chemo. We cycled up to the Seymour demonstration path to the reservoir. I was ready. So my close friend Richard Barbatsky, he lives in Montreal. He also experienced the same issues as I was facing. And he told me that surgeons loved working on him because he was so skinny. He didn't have to worry about all the fat that they had to get through. He was a pragmatic engineer as well, by the way. Waking up on October 7th, 2013, I entered the ostomy world. Wow, that's different. Recovery from that surgery was going to go quicker because it was going quicker than my bedmates in the hospital. And I firmly believe being in good physical condition helped me out. Ostomy world. Well, a lot of you know the ostomy world. Creams, appliances, that's what they call those little sticky bag things that you put on. I'm all, mine was right here. I'll even show you my little friend. Bob, I called him. Right there. There's Bob. <laughs> oh, sorry, you can't read that. That was my delicious diet that they fed me at the hospital. Has anybody ever had great food at the hospitals? No wonder they want you out of there. <laughs> anyway, it was frequent visits to my ostomy supply stores and meeting my favorite stoma nurses. They got to know me quite well. Life actually was not too bad. There were frustrations. Clothes didn't fit. Belt line came across the stoma occasionally. And apart from that one accident in bed, <laughs> that was a mess. I survived. <laughs> I had a few minor skin irritations and yeast infections. Who, well, who knew that? And, but I was able to go to the bathroom when I wanted to, and not when I needed to. For the next year, I only needed to go to the bathroom when I felt, with my hand, that my bag was full. I had an ileostomy. It was a reversible ileostomy, as you indicated in the earlier diagrams. And all this time, I was consuming four grams of capsidabin daily. Cracked nails, cracked heels were part of the side effects. At least I didn't lose any hair. <laughs> I ceremoniously consumed my final chemo pill sometime in April. I was elated to have finished the treatment. I suppose I wanted to forget the date and forget everything that I went through. Now, all I had to do is deal with a stoma, and it has its own challenges. Apart from the regular blood tests and visits to, by the way, I did the Movember thing. This is in November, five weeks after my surgery. I was at my cousin's wedding, and my boys stood beside me and said, Dad, oh, I can do I gotta show this to you. You're the king. You can do this. You can beat this. So they gave me a t-shirt. King Hato. Support like that is unbelievable. Well, apart from my blood, regular blood tests, visits with my, both my surgeon oncologist and CT scans, the next big date was the reversal of the ileostomy. Originally scheduled for, for one year following my surgery, it had to be postponed due to space availability in the OR. November 7th, 2014. Now I could look forward to being normal again. 
Nope. <laughs> Having a rusty valve in my system proved to be a little bit of a strain on me emotionally and physically. The nature of sewage control was something that was beyond me a bit. By the way, did I mention I was an engineer? <laughs> and so was my father and my brother. We were all civil engineers. That resonates with me because my father, was, his expertise was in sewage. <laughs> it's been one year, four months, five days since my reconnection surgery. I still deal with some of the issues and urgency, inability to evacuate everything, gas control, and some issues of sexual nature. I guess my career path won't include being a porn star. But I am happy to be here presenting to you an emotional, physical roller coaster, all because I didn't treat my body like I do my car. I didn't know my father had a history of polyps. I didn't take more urgent steps once finding blood in my stool. And most importantly, I did not ask for a colonoscopy at the age of 50. At 61, I had cancer. Through the knowledge, assessment, and surgical work of Dr. Carl Brown at St. Paul's, I beat it. Now to keep it away. Exercise, diet, moderation, alcohol consumption will help, but screening will be the most important part of my future. Tomorrow morning, I'm boarding a flight to Montreal, where on Sunday, I will present my youngest son with his iron ring for his graduation of engineering. Thank you. <laughs>